Good afternoon, and thank you for joining my webinar today. My name is Angel Weilman, and this is a webinar on test facility design techniques for pressure control. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. I am the speaker and also the host for this webinar series. This is the second in a new webinar series that Southwest Research Institute is putting on for our fluids engineering group. Um, and our next one is going to be coming up in March. And so I'm the host, so you'll be hearing from me every time if you tune into these webinars, but I'm also the presenter for today. And I am a senior research engineer here at Southwest Research Institute in the fluid dynamics section of the mechanical engineering department. I have seven years of experience at Southwest Research Institute, and most of that time I spent designing and operating flow loops for liquid and gas testing. And so that's where the information for this webinar comes from, from my experience and also some of the methodologies we use here at the Institute to design flow loops for high pressure situations and to operate them safely. This presentation is geared towards an audience um, who's planning on developing a new facility or upgrading an existing facility. And there's really three levels of pressure that I would think about for a flow loop. There's low pressure situations, which are 150 PSI or less. That's something like a, um, a compressed gas, your, your shop air system. Then there's what I would consider high pressure, which is anything between 150 PSI and 15,000 PSI. And then there's something I would call ultra high pressure. And this is 15,000 PSI up to 60,000 PSI and I guess above, if that's possible. Things tend to get different when you go above 15,000 PSI and material properties play a much larger role. Uh, equipment is more scarce. So it's I'm not gonna be focusing on that today. Um, I will be focusing on how to develop a flow loop that can be safely operated when you're dealing with pressure. So today we will first talk about how to determine your system requirements, what questions you should ask yourself when you're designing a flow loop. And then I'll discuss the layered approach to safety that Southwest Research employs when we're designing and constructing new flow loops. Then I'll go through three different case studies that talk about how we use these methods um, in a high pressure recirculating gas loop, a oil and water recirculating loop, and then I'll give an example about looking at specifically a pump for overpressure protection. There's a lot of questions you should ask yourself when you are designing a new flow loop or making changes to an existing one. The first question is, is it going to be a permanent facility or a temporary facility? And this makes a difference in the type of safety equipment you use and potentially the amount of money you want to spend on, on the flow loop. And if it's a permanent facility, you might spend a lot of money on safety equipment and documentation. Whereas if it's a temporary flow loop, you might spend more time on safety meetings and use portable safety signage and maybe like a rope chain to keep people away from the facility. Um, if you do a significant amount of custom setups, you might consider actually making a universal control software that contains a configurable safety shutdown that can be used for many different flow loops. That way you don't have to spend the money every time, but you can still get the same amount of safety. The next question to ask is, what is your maximum system pressure? And this is not really maximum allowable working pressure. So this goes into the next point. There's a difference between design pressure and maximum allowable working pressure. And really, you should design your system to comfortably operate in your design pressure. So if your weakest link in the, in the setup is 2,000 PSI, then your, your design pressure shouldn't be 2,000 PSI. It should be something less, like 1,500. So um, it's important to design to comfortably operate where you're going to be operating every day. The next point is, what is your weakest link? So you might have some piece of equipment in your facility that maybe it's a specialized piece of equipment and you couldn't find something with a higher allowable working pressure. This is your weakest link and you should pay attention. You should um, design your system to pay most attention to that spot. <laughs> um, the next point is budget. So the best option is to design your entire pr 
your entire system so that you literally cannot overpressurize it. Any pro if you can't overpressurize any single component. So that's not always an option due to budget and the nature of what you're testing. For instance, if your permanent system is rated to 2,000 PSI and your test article is rated to 1,700 PSI, then you should make the rest of your system rated to, um, to a high pressure, but I guess you can't always do that considering your budget. I'll give some examples later. Final question is, what is the fluids in your flow loop? If you're operating with gas, then there's different safety considerations than if you're operating with liquid. Similarly, if your flow loop is at elevated temperatures, this will play a role in your facility design. One motto I like to repeat is, if it can happen, it will. So when you're designing your system, if you say, oh, this specific chain of events needs to happen for an overpressure situation to occur, there's a chance that it might happen, so you should assume that it will and design for that situation. Next, I'd like to say that really the basis for a safe operating facility is establishing a quality system and a safety system. They go hand in hand. And um, a safety system is difficult to implement, I think, without a quality system. A robust quality system prevents accidents by enforcing documentation on facility designs, review of procedures, and proper training of facility operators. So system safety systems ensure that facilities are operated as they're intended and documented in the quality system, and that employees get to go home at the end of each workday. An example here is if you have a permanent system that has a process and instrumentation diagram, and someone needs to make a change to that system, then they will document the change on the process and instrumentation diagram. It'll be approved by a quality coordinator and maybe a safety coordinator. So several people will review it before it happens, and then the operators of that facility will be trained on that change so that someone doesn't take the facility to an operating point it is no longer intended for, and all of that is documented. If you don't have a safety or a quality system, there's a couple I could recommend that we adhere to at Southwest Research. The first is the API Q1, and the official title of this is Specification for the Quality Management System Requirements for Manufacturing Organizations for Petroleum and Natural Gas Industry. We comply to this because it's required in order to perform API 14A testing. Um, but we utilize it across all of our testing programs. The next one I would recommend is ISO 17025, and this is general requirements for the competence of testing and calibration laboratories. This is necessary since we calibrate our own instruments. API Q1 ensures that all of our instruments are calibrated on regular, on regular intervals, and our test procedures are documented, our test reports are documented, and all of these things allow us to operate our flow loop safely. The final one is ISO 9001, which is quality management systems requirements. And this is really for reporting. It's, you have to report everything that you do so that you can go back and repeat it later if you need to. Okay. Next, I will discuss our layered approach to safety. Short of designing your test facility to be made out of components that are all rated to twice your maximum pressure and operating the facility with 100% automation inside a blast cell, there's really no one task to perform when creating a safe flow facility and testing with pressure. Throughout this presentation, I'll discuss the layered approach to safety where hardware controls, software controls, and human controls work together to create a facility that can be operated safely while still being economical and practical. Uh, the goal of this process is to first make an overpressure event impossible. Then if that's not feasible, prevent the operator from being able to create an overpressure event through software controls. And then if that fails, design relief systems into the facility to remediate an overpressure event quickly, if one occurs. And if that fails, if that fails to relieve the pressure and the overpressure event leads to a sudden release of pressure, that's not through a relief valve, you can utilize hardware restraints to keep flow loop pieces from becoming projectiles and injuring personnel or damaging equipment. In the event that all of these measures fail, then you limit personnel exposure to the flow loop through dynamic, during dynamic events 
um, through safety boundaries and warning signage. Finally, the operator should be trained on the flow loop and follow all the published work instructions. So now I'm going to go through a basic example. This is a very simple process and instrumentation diagram. We call them PNIDs. And here you can see a tank. Um, and the, the purpose of these diagrams is to show the general layout um, of the equipment and not actually the physical location of where everything is. But it shows that the pump, the test article follows the pump, et cetera. So we'll start with a tank and whatever fluid it is flows through this pump. Here's a temperature transmitter upstream, pressure switch downstream, and it goes to a test article. Here's a control valve where you might meter or control the pressure upstream and the flow rate and downstream pressure. And then it goes through a filter and maybe a flow through heater if you're heating up the system. So we can assume that this is a positive displacement pump that will continue to build pressure if a flow path is blocked. So our possible safety risk here is overpressurization of the piping and the test article. So for this example, we'll say that the control valve was accidentally closed. This control valve here, control valve, uh, while the pump is circulating fluid in the flow loop. This will cause PT1 to increase. And so our safety control number one will be to design the piping between the pump and the control valve to high, have a higher pressure rating than the maximum pressure the pump can produce. Safety control number two will be a software rule that the control valve cannot be closed past a certain value, say 10% open if the pump is running. Safety control number three will be a software shutdown that will put the flow loop in a safe state if PT1 goes above a set point. And we'll discuss later where the set point for PT1 should be. For this flow loop, uh, a safe state may be to turn off the pump and turn off and open the control valve to a set value, say 15%. Safety control number four will be to install a pressure switch on the outlet of the pump that is set higher than the safe software shutdown discussed as safety control number three. If the pressure rises above the threshold of the pressure switch, the pump will shut down. If that should fail, safety control number five is PSV1, which is set higher than the pressure switch, which is set higher than the software shutdown. If for some reason that failed, safety control number six should be restraints that are put in place that would prevent personal personnel injury. If there's a sudden release of pressure. Um, this isn't shown on the PNID, but we'll discuss it later. Finally, safety control number seven is to limit personnel exposure in the area. Um, and items such as safety signage and warning lights can be used to keep personnel out of the area. Dynamic events um, that you would want to keep people out of the flow loop are typically pressurization, flowing, venting, or anything where the loop is in a non-static state. That's where you'd want to keep people, limit people's exposure. Finally, as mentioned earlier, if it can happen, it will. If it can happen, it will. So looking at this flow loop, another potential source of blockage on the flow loop is clogging the filter. The down, piping downstream of the control valve is likely to be rated to a lower pressure than that upstream of the control valve. So a secondary PSV should be installed um, that is set to prevent an overpressure event on the lower pressure rated piping. So that's our example. Now we'll walk through the three different types of um, of the three different layers of safety. The first one that I mentioned, will mention, is software controlled safety. And this includes things such as a enable switch, which might disconnect your control software from your flow loop operations. This is kind of the corollary to an e-stop an e switch. So if the enable switch is not on, your software actually cannot do anything on the flow loop. And you might, you might want this if the control room is remote from your facility operation. That way you can make sure no one comes into the control room and does something while you're out at the flow loop. Another um, software controlled safety feature can be pressure shutdowns in your data acquisition system and possibly adding modes to your control software. If you have different types of tests that you want to run in the same facility, different modes will stop you from doing things that will create an overpressure event. Also, this is a byproduct of a quality system, is creating uneditable software versions, 
Once you've created a software version where the safety features have been va validated and verified, you create an executable so no one can accidentally change them without anyone being aware of it. And finally, you can have unallowed actions, which are software rules, like I mentioned earlier, where maybe a pump cannot run or you can, can't um, close a flow path while a pump is running. So software rules are different from safety shutdowns. And these are the first software defense and are intended to keep an overpressure event from happening and keeping the flow loop operating. It can be very disruptive for, soft, uh, for software safety shutdowns to continually put the flow loop in a safe state. Let's say you're running the flow loop doing flow performance testing on this test article and you keep hitting your pressure switch and it shuts the pump off. So you can't get data and people start to get annoyed. And when people get annoyed, they tend to bypass safety features and cause accidents, which is dangerous. So if you have a software rule in place, then such as this, this rule I mentioned just a second ago, the pump cannot turn on when the control valve is less than 5% open, or while the pump is on, the control valve cannot be positioned at less than 5% open. This way, the operator can't put themselves in a, in a place where the pressure switch will shut off the pump and disrupt their, their testing. The next item I'll discuss is hardware control safety. And this includes things such as flow component pressure ratings, the pressure rating of your piping, your valves, and um, also then your re pressure relief systems, such as PSVs and rupture disks. Also, independently wired safety switches that aren't controlled by your data acquisition system that will shut off pumps or heaters or other things um, in order to create, uh, prevent an overpressure event. And then finally, flow component restraints, if everything goes poorly. Uh, I'm going to have a note here on PSV setting because it's, it's something that we discuss often here at Southwest Research Institute. And, um, I'm not going to discuss how to design a, um, how, to, how to size a PSV. I think that that should be done by professionals. API 521 does give a list of potential causes of overpressure. Um, the ones we see the most are isolation valves leaking or an unintentional temperature increase. So let's say you locked in some gas and it heats up um, without you expecting it to. This can create overpressure. So in that case, um, you would like to have a PSV in line. Um, we typically set our PSVs at the maximum allowable working pressure or 10 to 20% over design pressure. And that's it's always at least at maximum allowable working pressure. As I mentioned earlier, your design pressure should be in a comfortable operating condition. So 10% or 20% over should still be below your maximum allowable working pressure but it shouldn't be a situation you run into often. Also, um, ensure that your relief system can handle the flow requirements. And I mentioned earlier that I, you know, we're not, I'm not going to give a instruction on how to size a relief valve. However, you don't want to have a quarter inch wage lock relief valve on you know, a two inch gas piping situation. I, if you have an over, over pressure event, that quarter inch swage lock relief valve is probably not going to handle the flow requirements. So be sure that you give the proper requirements to whoever is sizing your valve. And um, usually a distributor can do that for you. Burst discs are um, very accurate in their in their rupture state, but that's only on the first run. Um, they, they are uh, susceptible to pressure cycle fatigue. So we typically set our burst disc 20% over design pressure because they will weaken as you use them and they might end up relieving at much lower pressure than even design pressure if they're cycled too many times. You can combine PSVs and burst discs and you can put the burst disc upstream of the PSD if you PSV if you're worried about corrosion of your PSV seat or possibly your PSV simmering and loss of inventory. So that is an option. I'm going to have a note here about um, pressurized line restraints. And this is something that um, they're pretty cheap to implement and they really can save you if you are near a line that comes off during an overpressure event. The ones that we typically use are uh, whip stops and whip checks. And I'm going to show a video here. 
to show how your hardware selection matters. This is not a uh, endorsement of this company, but it is a very interesting video about the difference between a whip sock and a whip check. This one is actually, they're showing a, um, this is an import. I guess it is not as high quality as the one that they are trying to sell, but that is a whip stop. Let me see here. So this is how whip spot stops are supposed to operate. During an overpressure, instead of whipping around, the pressure is relieved. And as long as that whip stop is anchored appropriately, it will stop the hose from whipping around and potentially causing harm to somebody. And here's what happens when you have a whip check. And I think this is not high pressure with gas. I believe it's like 150 PSI. So even though that line is restrained, that man is mannequin is about six feet away from that pressure source. So that's not a place you want to be. And so whip checks on something small, such as, whoop, there's the dead mannequin, um, as something small like this airline that goes into this actuator, um, the whip check is properly restrained and this thing shouldn't whip around too much, but it's a small line for our high pressure hoses. This is a picture of one of our high pressure hoses where we use a whip stop. The last layer in the layered approach is human controlled safety. And I put this last because it really should be your last line of defense. And this is things such as warning lights and signage, PPE while you're in the operating, air, operating facility, proper training um, according to a published and revision controlled work instruction is also very important. So now I'm gonna go through three case studies and they're at varying levels of severity and safety implementation. So hopefully it should be interesting. This facility is a 10,000 PSI recirculating gas flow loop that is used for gas lift valves. And the facility can provide flows up to 18 million standard cubic feet per day at 275 degrees Fahrenheit with 10,000 PSI of either methane or nitrogen or combination thereof. Since this flow loop pushes the envelope of typical flow loop capabilities, a lot of time and energy was spent on the design for safety. And that shows through in the hardware as well as the software on this flow loop. So I'll describe it a little bit. Uh, we have 10 reciprocating um, compressors with the intensifiers on top here. So there's 10 of them that are the prime movers for the facility. And gas is pumped into one of these volumes here that goes through two inch piping, makes a loop around the flow facility, goes through a test article, which is a gas lift valve, a series of flow meters, and then heat is rejected through the air cooled heat exchanger, which you see in red there and then back to a volume where the compressors draw from it. I'll go through our methodology one more time. Uh, for, this, for this facility, the um, first thing is to stop the operator from accidentally creating an overpressure situation. And if it happens, have the software put the system in a safe state. If the software fails to stop the overpressure, then use hardware relief devices to bring the system back from overpressure situation quickly. If the relief devices fail, then the hardware restraints will keep flow components from becoming projectiles and hurting personnel. And then finally, keep all area, keep personnel out of the area, um, out of away from the system in case of failure. This is uh, one screen of the front panel of our safety, or of our of our software control, our control software. We use LabVIEW um, for most of our data acquisition and control systems here. And uh, we have good experience with it and implementing safety shutdowns into it is, um, is relatively easy. So obviously this is a very complex system and our operators go through formal training before they're allowed to operate this flow loop by themselves. There's five, four other panels that you don't even see here where um, other information is being displayed, but this is where the main controls are. Um, let's see, in order to uh, accommodate the many different rules of operation for this software, we've created modes. Um, and in which the software can be used. So here's our operating mode. 
Right now, the facility is set in disable all controls. So if you can see everything, all the, the buttons which represent valves here, these are grayed out and you can't actually click on them and actuate them. It does tell you what their current state is, red for closed, green for open. Everything else that is displayed here is a output from a pressure transmitter or a temperature transmitter. The next mode um, is enable all controls. Switch the mode over here. And now you can see that everything is allowed to be actuated. Well, almost everything. There's still some rules that don't allow us to actuate these two valves. And then here's another operation where we will be filling the system with methane. So in this case, the methane source comes from, methane source here is what it's labeled, and it flows across this panel and across a flow meter. But this is our nitrogen source, and you could see that that's blocked out. So we actually aren't allowed to put methane and nitrogen in at the same time. This also doesn't allow us to insert the methane and go straight to our vent. So there's several unallowed actions that keep the operator from doing things that are unintended. These modes are very useful for complicated flow loops. Um, they may not be useful for, um, let's say, a universal software that you would make for temporary flow loops, but they do help the operator with a very complex P&ID such as this one. In this facility, I'm going to go over a few different hardware controls because the pressures are so high. I have uh, two PSVs shown here, and there's a high pressure and a low pressure. High pressure on the right, low pressure on the left. We have found that PSVs in the 10,000 PSI and up range don't always receipt. Um, that's just in our experience, and they typically have to be taken apart and rebuilt every time. So why not use a burst disc here? It's the question that I asked at first. But if you remember, our burst discs fatigue, fatigue over time, and they might end up bursting at a much lower pressure than expected. So we have decided to use PSVs in the unlikely event that they would set themselves off. We can just take them apart and rebuild them. If you can notice anything strange about this PSV, low pressure PSV on the left here, could be that the isolation valve is closed. So that's something that's important. A lot of times isolation valves are installed upstream of a PSV so that it can be removed and checked for a vessel that is normally pressurized. This one has locking bolts on it or holes on it. So you can lock out, lock it out or lock it open. So that's always something, pay attention. If you have a PSV, make sure that the valve to it is also open. Also, both, these, both of these PSVs have restraints so that the piping isn't damaged if they go off. And they're both kind of on you know, smaller tubing. So if they were to go off without restraints, then you could turn that tubing into spaghetti at these high pressures. The next hardware control I'll go over is um, restraints for tubing and for piping. We have some tubing that is one inch or less. We have two inch piping and we have some um, some hoses in this facility. You could see that most of our tubing has um, stuff clamps that is like physically welded to a panel. And this is how these are restrained on this panel. For areas where we don't have as rigid of a mount, this panel is quite a bit flimsier and it's not rigidly mounted down as the other one is. So this is a long stretch of pipe. And we've used something called a hose hobble and it's a nylon hose with a stuff clamp. And this, um, this tape here is actually recommended by the manufacturer. And the intent here is if this uh, connection were to come apart, this is quite a long piece of tubing, it's like a 20 foot piece of tubing, that the hose hobble would get caught on the stuff clamp, which would get caught on this tape and would stop the, the piece of tubing from becoming a hose. And at these pressures, that is definitely what happens. The second case study here is a, um, or the second piece of piping in our case study are the two inch pressurized lines. Um, these are 15K rated tubing or pipe, but um, we're concerned that if something was to come apart, these are gray lock connections here, that we need a way to grab onto this piping to keep it from becoming a projectile. It's 10,000 PSI gas and um, so we employed these Weir SPM flow line safety restraint 
and again, this is not a recommendation or an endorsement of them. It's just, this is what we've used on our system. I have a video that I can show you of how these work. Let me pull the video up. So we actually tested this at our facility. This is um, that same piping. This is actually three inch and it is a pressurized at 22,000 PSI. This is what it looks like when it comes apart. But as you can see, these restraints keep the keep the piping from flying away. It keeps it together. Still, we don't allow personnel in the area while we're under dynamic situations. I will play this video in reverse because I think it's really interesting. I'll try to do it a little bit slowly because I know it's choppy. And this is just with water. So you can imagine what happens with gas. So there's many different types of hardware restraints and you should definitely look into them before you design your facility. Let me bring the presentation back up. Okay, now I'll move on to human controls. And um, in this facility, you can see all the safety signage we have here. We don't allow cellular phones. It's a class one, div two area. We also have a published safety document that lays out our primary exits and entrances. This, the whole facility is fenced in and there's access control. You need a badge to get into the facility. And we have warning lights outside that let the user, let non-users know if the facility is pressurized. And we require eye protection, hearing protection. And we have, um, we also have a two-man rule. So a single person may enter with no pressure, but, and if the enable switch is off, but if there is pressure in the area, you'd be in two-way radio communication. So we have quite a bit of human controls around this loop as well. Our next case study that I'll talk about is a 2000 PSI liquid flow loop. And this was created to test um, downhole tools with oil and water at up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And there is no gas in this system. Uh, there's a little bit of gas in our separator in order to keep some pressure in there, but it's, it's low pressure compared to the last facility that we talked about. And so there's less likelihood of a flow component becoming a projectile if it does get disconnected here. So you'll see that there aren't flow, there aren't safety restraints. The piping is actually just sitting on pipe stands here. And these are our test articles. Also, the other thing to note is that the control software, the control computer is right next to the flow loop. So the, the need for an enable switch, you don't have one here. There is an E stop, but there is not an enable switch since you can tell if someone is at the computer while you're working on the flow loop. This is a screenshot from the front of its control software. And you can see that there are safety shutdowns that are, um, they are actually configurable and you can tell if they are active or you can turn them off and it says if they're tripped or untripped. And this facility has one separator and two pumps that flow through. Um, this looks like a single test article because there are, were three installed, but you only operate one at a time. And um, there, are, there are shutdowns for high oil pressure um, from, the, from the oil pump, and then there's a high pressure from the water pump. And um, there's other low pressure uh, items like from the separator and high temperature from the heater. This is where the shutdowns are configured. And you could see here's the condition, the oil pump, if the pressure right after the oil pump is greater than 2150, here's the action, shut down both pumps and heater. So this is nice because we can change these for different setting for different setups and it's configurable. We can also turn them on and off as we need to. 
We also have a pressure switch after each pump, after the oil pump and the water pump, and those are wired independently. If those switches are activated, they will shut down that pump. They will also shut down the heater. There's also an e-stop button here that will shut down the pumps and the heater. And the heater has its own control box, but it's also controlled from the software. And this is a picture of the downstream of one of these triplex pumps. So since they are triplex pumps, they do have the potential to overpressurize the facility quickly if there was a blockage, which is why just downstream there is a pressure switch that is connected to this pump. And then downstream of that, there is a PSV that is, um, it actually rejects the fluid back into the separator. And when you're doing that, you need to remember to design your PSV such that it opens at the required differential pressure, since you will have up to, let's say in this case, like 100 PSI back pressure, PSV needs to be sized so that it, it overcomes a differential pressure that we require. It's an easy way to undersize a PSV on accident doing that. On the outside of this test facility, we have signage and lights. I'll let the operators or non-operators know what's going on inside the facility. And that's it for case study number two. The final case study that I'll talk about is, this is kind of one I ran into in recently. It's a progressive cavity pump. And the interesting thing about it is that it has, we designed it for a discharge pressure of 600 PSI. It has a maximum output pressure of 700 PSI. There's no check valves like there are in a, um, in a triplex pump, but it has a, and so it has a non-flowing maximum pressure rating of 1500 PSI. The pump can't physically make 1500 PSI, but if it was, if it was subjected to that, it would damage the motor, It'd be less, um, a safety concern, more of a, it would, it would damage the equipment. So here's my um, mythical PS, uh, P&ID that I set up to show this. Let's say you have a tank here with um, our pump. This is our pump one, this is our Moino pump designed for 600 PSI. And it, its normal operation is to flow fluid through this test article. And say this is water, maybe water with sand or something. Um, and then after you erode it for a while, you close in, you turn off the pump, close in the test article with these two isolation valves, and then use a secondary pump to do a pressure test on it. And this one, let's say, has a maximum output of 5,000 PSI. So while you're performing this 5,000 PSI test on the test article, there's a potential for fluid to leak backwards through the um, and into the pump one and piping area and cause an overpressure event. So your first line of defense is to have an isolation valve with a backup check valve. So um, the second, and if that fails, if the pressure goes through, your second line of defense is to rate this isolation valve, VB1, to um, right now we're going to say it's 850. And it needs to be at least at the same pressure rating as your highest relief device. And also you'd want to rate the piping at at least that high. So let's say your piping was rating at 1500, which is what the non-flowing pump rated pressure is. And that valve is rated at 850. Your next line of defense is PSV1. And our, we would set this here at 10% over our maximum output pressure at 770 PSI. So again, this is not something that would occur when the pump was just flowing by itself. It would have to be when this other pump, the 5,000 PSI pump, bleed blood pressure back into that piping area. Our next line of defense will be this burst disc. And we'll set this 20% higher at 850 PSI. So as a last line of defense, um, that burst disc is set, and then you probably would want to keep people out of the area when you're doing that 5,000 PSI pump test. Final note I would like to say is that while you're designing your facility, 
uh, lockout tagout procedures are required for um, for most facilities. So be sure to design for them. And one of the common gotchas is having actuators on valves that don't display the state of the valve. So you can see this image here on the left shows an actuator that clearly says whether it's open or closed. So after the operator puts that valve into the state it needs to be in, they can visually check to make sure that that valve is open or closed before they can officially say the system is locked out. The second thing is to put as many pressure gauges as you can in your system. Pressure indication is something that you'll never regret installing. It's always better to know than to not know. So if you have the budget, it, I recommend putting in as much, many pressure transmitters or gauges as possible. They also help with lockout tagout to determine it, verify there's no pressure in the system. And finally, um, it's it's nice if you can lock out individual valves. This is actually the the airline that's running to this actuator, and it has a whip check on it, as we saw before. This is the, um, the air source, and you could shut off the air to it and have a valve that you can physically lock open to say that this valve is off and it doesn't have air to it. There's no way for it to turn back on. So with that, I'd like to thank you for attending and listening to my webinar. And if you have any further questions, my information is on the screen, and I would be very happy to hear from you. Thank you. Bye.